Hello and welcome to the lecture on object detection. So let's first start by defining what is object detection? What is this task um, that we actually have to solve? So for the object detection problem, we start with an image and what we want to find is actually all the interesting objects in that image. In this case, we can see a penguin and how we actually want to represent the penguin is through uh, this rectangle that we actually draw and that it fits tightly the object inside. Now the presentation for the representation for our bounding box is going to be um, these four values. So it's going to be represented by the bottom left corner in pixel space, so x, y, and by two other values, the height and the width of the bounding box. Now, of course, the object detection problem is not as easy as it seems. So the type of scenes and the type of objects that we're interested in uh, detecting in 2020 are actually these types of scenes. So you can see that many objects are overlapping each other. We have different objects, different uh, semantic categories um, that are actually assigned or attached to each of the bounding box. So aside from um, depicting objects with a bounding box, what we also want to provide is a class. So a class that says what type of objects, a semantic class, that tells you there is a car inside the box or a bicycle or a person. So we actually want to build this a generic object detection method that can detect all these types of objects and actually draw a bounding box around them and at the same time assign a class to them. So let's start with a bit of history, um, nothing about uh, deep learning just yet. Let's just start seeing how object detection was approached before uh, deep learning actually appeared. So traditional object detection methods actually relied on template matching plus sliding window. So in our case, what we had was an image with different objects, in this case, these flamingos, and we actually had a template which was, let's say, a small image that depicted one object that we actually wanted to detect. Usually this template showed the object in the exact same position um, where we actually expected to, um, to see it in the test image. And then how we would actually use this template is with a sliding window approach. So we would start by putting this template on the top left corner of the image and we would slide it all the way through the image. So we would just take this template and moving around, move it around, place it on top of the different parts of the image in this sliding window fashion. And what we would do at every position where we actually place the template is we would actually compute the correlation between template and image. Right, so you would actually evaluate how much the pixels in the image and the template correlate. So for example, if you would place the flamingo on the bottom left corner, you would achieve a low correlation because as you can see, there was no flamingo in the image. Now, if you actually place this template on top of where this flamingo in this exact position is, then you would get a really high correlation. So you could actually deduce that there is a flamingo, in fact, on that part of the image. Now, of course, um, this is a very um, kind of rudimentary approach and it has tons of problems. So the first problem is that if the flamingo is partially covered, which is normal in the scenes that we have seen uh, with, with all the cars and the bikers, objects occluding each other, so often you have to detect objects that are almost um, fully occluded. So in this case, if we were to place this occluder, this, this blue box on top of this flamingo, suddenly when we put the template on top of that position, we would get a low correlation instead of a high correlation. So template matching plus sliding window doesn't really work well with occlusions. So first um, condition that we need for the template matching approach to work is that we need to see the whole object or almost all of the object. And um, we actually also need to have uh, the exact instance of the object. Right, so how we, um, how we can see it in this, um, in this example of a chair is that we, our template doesn't include 
the class chair for all types of chair objects, but includes one specific chair. So if we see that specific model of the chair in our test image, then we will be able to detect it. If we see a different shape, like we can see here on the left, there are different appearances and shapes for chairs. So if we suddenly now find another type of chair, then we will not be able to detect it. So template matching only works given an instance of an object, but not the class of objects. And furthermore, this instance has to be shown in the exact same pose. So you can see on the right, we have three chairs which are displayed in different poses. And this actually also doesn't work for the template matching. So in real life, objects actually have an unknown position. They have an unknown scale, unknown aspect ratio, unknown pose. So actually the search pace is really searched very inefficiently with a sliding window. So imagine that you have your flamingo and suddenly your flamingo is a bit further away from the image, so it's displayed a little bit smaller. You would actually have to test not only different positions where you should place your template, but you should also try different scales of your template to actually detect flamingos that are a bit further away uh, from the camera. So there are a lot of conditions that need to be fulfilled for this template matching plus sliding window approach to actually work. So instead of this approach, um, object detection methods actually moved quickly towards the paradigm of feature extraction plus classification. And the best detector to exemplify this is the Viola and Jones detector. So this was kind of the first detector that worked really well with this paradigm of feature extraction plus classification. So it was presented in 2001, as you can see um, in, this, in this reference below. And the main idea was um, that the method would actually learn, so, so here there's already a bit of machine learning involved, so the method would actually learn multiple weak learners to build a strong classifier. And what this actually means is that uh, you would actually learn to make um, a lot of small decisions, and then you would combine them to make a strong final decision. So let's see with an example here. So the Viola and Jones detector worked with a feature extraction method with hard features. And uh, these were features um, like you can see here on the screen. So this kind of, for example, um, dark bar with a white bar at the bottom. And uh, it was used mainly for face detection. So you can see, for example, in the area of the eyes, you have the eyes which are darker than this part here of the nose. So this horizontal pattern actually fits pretty well to this uh, front part, this, this upper part of the eyes. While you can see the other uh, feature, which are these two dark bars with a white bar in the middle, this actually fits pretty well towards the two dark areas of the eyes and the bright area of the nose. So you would actually take these hard features and you would slide them through the image and whenever these um, two features would actually coincide with the eye um, region of a face, they would fire and they would say, hey, there's really a strong correlation in this area. So these two features were actually used to detect faces. Now, how this would work in, um, in detail would be first, you would need to select your hard light features, right? These are handcrafted features, so you actually need to come up with these features yourself. Then on a second step, you would actually evaluate these features, essentially the sliding window approach. But in order to do it fast, you do it using what is called an integral image. So you can actually uh, Google for this concept because we don't have uh, really time to explain it here, but it's really a concept that is used quite a lot in classic computer vision. And essentially what this would do is it would give you the parts of the image that have the highest correlation with each of your hard like um, template. And in step three, you would actually go for the machine learning uh, part. So you would actually uh, want to find all these best set of weak learners and 
every week learner is represented by one of these hard like features. So you would select the ones that work best for the task, for example, of face detection. And then you would have this final classifier, which is just the linear combination of all these weak learners. So you can imagine that you have your hard like features for detecting the eye area, your hard like features that um, are actually good for detection of your mouth area. You would combine all these um, tiny uh, features, all these, all these small decisions, these weak learners, and you would create a strong face classifier. So this actually works pretty well. You can see some of the results here. Now, especially for uh, frontal faces, this works really well. Um, of course, once you start having, for example, in this case, uh, some face that looks sideways, um, the, the, um, the hard-like features actually don't overlap so well with this, uh, with this type of side faces. And so uh, the viola and Jones detector was actually not able to detect that type of faces. But otherwise, it worked actually really well. Okay, so a second approach um, that is actually very, very famous and works with the feature extraction plus classification paradigm is the histogram of oriented gradients uh, detector or HOC um, detector. And these are actually a more advanced set of features. Right, so if you want to improve um, this uh, upon this paradigm, if you want to improve, you can actually go for improving the features or uh, improving the classification itself. So, so the machine learning algorithm. So in this case, they did both, right? So they presented a new set of, set of features called the histogram of oriented gradients. So in this case, they start from this very, very strong notion that we use in image processing and in computer vision, which is the gradient of an image. So you can see here um, gradients depicted uh, with these blue arrows. And basically, they show the direction of greatest change of the image. And this is actually really interesting because if you look at how objects are represented, generally, you would um, start drawing an, ob an object by drawing its edges. Right, so, so the contour of the object. And this is a place where you're very, very likely, um, likely to actually find a strong gradient. Right, so you see, for example, you have here uh, the end of my arm. And this would have a very strong gradient with a wall behind because it's really wide. So gradients are actually a very strong cue in image processing and in computer vision to perform, for example, object detection. So what they would do is they would compute, um, so, so this, uh, this paper in particular and, and the HOC um, feature were actually uh, presented for um, person detection. So this is why you will see a lot of silhouettes of person depicted in this presentation. And uh, what they would observe then is that a standing person, right? So we're not going to detect persons in different poses, but we're going to detect standing uh, pedestrians. And what they observe is that actually if you take the average gradient image over all training samples for pedestrian detection, you would already almost obtain the shape of this person. So the gradient is actually a really, really strong information. So they said, okay, let's, let's actually create a descriptor that exploits that. Um, so how they did it is um, they would take an image and they would compute the gradients in dense grids. So they would divide the image in a grid and they would compute all of the gradients in those dense grids. And then they would create a histogram with those gradients. So you can see here all this type of, of representation of the, of the gradients in the different directions. So they would actually create a histogram with all of these gradients within this patch of the image. And then essentially they would go for the classification, right? So these are your features, the features that you're going to use. And then um, they would start by computing these features on um, a training set. Then they would choose um, a set of images that do not contain that object and also compute the features there. And finally, they would train an SVM classifier, support vector machine classifier on the two sets and they would actually detect what is the difference from the training set that actually contains 
the person. So what is the difference between those features there and the features computed on the images that do not contain a person, right? So they would basically use these features and then train a classifier to predict yes and no, is there a person or is there not a person? So you can see here already that we're starting to delve into what is going to be closer to the deep learning paradigm, this, this type of feature extraction plus classification on top. And actually, if you, if you visualize the, these kind of hog features weighted by the positive uh, support vector machine weights, so actually those features that help in the classification of a person, you actually see the shape of this person. So, so these kind of, um, of features on the edges of the person but the ones that were used to detect this pedestrian. Now, an evolution of that is uh, the deformable, deformable part model or a DPM detector. So um, we're talking already about a 2008 contribution. So this already uh, starts being a modern contribution and there's actually um, quite a lot of parallelisms between the DPM detector and a CNN-based detector. Now this detector was also based on hog features, but now instead of detecting the full person that had to be in this really strict uh, position, um, what they proposed to do was um, what if we actually would detect each body part independently? And then what we can do is we can put these body parts together. And if they fit together nicely, we can say that there's a person in the image. So now instead of being only able to detect really rigid pedestrians in a predefined pose, they were able to detect people in different poses. So now that we have seen a brief history of three important works in uh, object detection, we want to move uh, towards general object detection. So we have to detect all types of objects in all types of conditions, uh, poses, partial occlusions, illumination changes, etc., etc. So the first thing that we need to actually define is um, what is an object, right? So we look at, for example, this image with the two dogs, and we can, of course, say that each of the dogs is an object that we would like to actually detect. But for example, the grass in the background is not really an object, right? So, so we have this uh, inherent concept of what is an object. And uh, we would actually need a generic class agnostic objectness measure, right? So we would like to know for each um, region in the image how likely it is to contain an object. So if we were to place random bounded boxes uh, on top of this image, we would actually all agree and we would all conclude that um, the two green boxes, which depict the dogs, are very likely to be an object, while all the other boxes are not so likely to be an object. So um, using this measure, we can actually create what is called object proposals. So regions of interest where we think there might be an object and what we actually want to focus all of our learning, all of, all, all of the power of learning to differentiate whether, you know, this is an object or not. And furthermore, whether this is a dog or a car or any type of object that we would like to detect. So um, essentially how we can approach this generic object detection um, task is actually by first generating this set of what we call object proposals and then putting a classifier on top. So still two separate um, operations. Now there are several object proposal methods. Uh, we will not go into detail, but I would recommend that you read these two works. So these are uh, very interesting works, very much used uh, in the literature, especially um, the first one, Selective Search, which, which um, was actually used in um, the first version of a very famous two-stage detector, which we'll actually see in the next lecture. So I would recommend that you read uh, both of these works, which are object uh, proposal methods. 
Now, um, of course, what happens with, with object proposal methods is they look at all the image and they start proposing parts of the image which are likely to contain an object. But um, it doesn't mean that we actually get one perfect box around the object, one perfect box around another object. We actually uh, obtain from these methods many boxes that are trying to explain one object. So in this case, uh, we can see all of these boxes placed roughly around the truck, but in different scales, um, slightly different positions. So uh, in order to make this efficient, we actually need a method um, that keeps only the best boxes. So we don't need to evaluate all of these boxes um, to see whether there's a truck in there. So we would actually prefer to first select the most promising boxes um, that are actually overlapping this object. So how we can do this is um, by using non-maximum suppression. And you will see that this method is constantly used over and over again um, in many parts of an object detector. So this is a very important method that is used uh, widely in the literature. And what essentially it does is it looks at these three boxes that are uh, on top of the track and it selects the one that best fits the object according to some measure that we actually need to define. And so how it works essentially is um, you actually start with an anchor box. So you start with one of the boxes. Um, then you look for another box that is um, overlapping your box. If they overlap more than a threshold, and this threshold is actually a hyperparameter that you have to kind of play around with, then you're going to discard the box I if the score is lower than the score of the box J. So essentially, if I have two boxes that are overlapping each other quite a lot, it's very likely that they're both depicting the same object. So you actually take the one with the highest score. And um, there are two things right, that we need to define. First of all, how much overlap do we want to have? And how do we measure overlap between the bounding boxes? And then the score. So of course, this depends on the task at hand. Now, as for region overlap, typically in object detection, we measure region overlap with the intersection of our union, also called the Jacquard index. So here we have two boxes, A and B, and you can compute two measures. You can compute the intersection, which is essentially this blue area in the middle, so the part of the image in which the two boxes overlap. And then you can compute the union of the two boxes. So what is the total area that the two boxes span? And basically now you compute the intersection over union or the Jacquard index as um, the intersection divided by the union. So essentially, a Jacquard index that is going to be really hard, or an intersection over union is going to be really high, if the intersection and the union are very similar, right? So you can imagine the two bounding boxes that are closer and closer together. So the intersection is increasing quite a lot, and the union is slowly become, becoming almost the same as the intersection. Right? So this is where uh, you're going to have a really high intersection over union. Now, another possibility is that um, the intersection between two bounding boxes is really large. Uh, but the bounding boxes are so large that the union is even larger. Right? So this is why we actually use um, the division of intersection over union, because it can be that two very small bounding boxes overlap quite a lot and therefore depict almost the same object. And it can be that two large bounding boxes overlap the same amount as the small ones, so the intersection is exactly the same, but the union is really large. So they are most likely not depicting the same object. So this is why we actually cannot use only the intersection, but we need the intersection divided by the union of the two bounding boxes to kind of take into account the scale of the bounding box. 
So once we have defined the overlap, uh, we need to define um, this hyperparameter. And this is actually a really important hyperparameter. So what this is telling you is that you're not going to allow bounding boxes that are overlapping more than this threshold here. So what happens then is that if you have a really crowded scene, you have a lot of persons walking around, and you actually want to detect persons that are overlapping heavily with one another, which is a very common case if the scene is really crowded, um, if you have two persons that are overlapping, let's say, uh, with an intersection over union of uh, 0 0.7, and you set this threshold, this NMS threshold, to 0 0.6, it means that you will never be able to represent these two pedestrians, these two objects, that are overlapping more than this threshold here. So this threshold is actually really important and you kind of have to play around with it depending on whether you want to detect objects that are overlapping more or less. Now, um, this is this, I'm going to kind of explain it a little bit more here. Um, with this depiction in which we have um, on the y-axis uh, the score that we would get, for example, from an object detection. And then we have uh, the image domain on the, on the x-axis. So what is happening is, is we have two uh, detections, right? So we have um, the, in, on these two uh, peaks of this function, we have the ground truth positions for these two detections, right? These are the green dots. So um, if we actually choose a very narrow threshold, what's going to happen is we're going to start from this position and we're going to look around and we're going to say within this threshold is any detection or does any detection have a higher score than me? And for this detection, there's not going to be a higher score. So we're going to say, you know, up until here on the left and up until here, I'm going to be the only detection given, which means that I do allow this detection to kind of live on. Now, what happens if you have a very narrow threshold is that you can have what is called false positives. So you can have detections, in this case, the two red dots, which are actually, you know, th these detections are allowed to survive after non-maximum suppression, but these are not really detections. These are just points that are outside of these thresholds, and you can see this is the point with the highest score. And this is the point with the highest score outside of this threshold. So with a narrow threshold, we get the two ground positions nicely detected, but we also have two false positives. So we can say that we have a high recall, so we have detected the true ground truth positions, but we have a low precision because we're firing false positives all over the place. Now what happens if we choose a wider threshold? Well then what happens is that the ground truth position kind of takes over the second detection, right? So this has a much higher score, so in Within this threshold, there cannot be any detection with um, a score that is lower than this one, which means that this ground truth detection becomes a false negative. This is actually a detection that was not detected. So a ground truth detection that was not detected. This is a false negative. And at the same time, we create a false positive here because of course, this is still outside of the threshold. So in general, with a wider threshold, what we have is a low recall. So we are missing some of the detections that we would like to actually get because um, this threshold is too wide. And so the detections with a higher score actually eat up all the other detections that are within this threshold. So usually for all detectors, even deep learning ones, uh, non-maximum suppression is going to be used at test time. So usually a detector will give um, several boxes that can explain the object. And using NMS, we will choose the final output for the object detector. So after the introduction of these basic concepts uh, of object detection, we start moving towards learning-based object detectors. 
So since the arrival of uh, deep learning in computer vision around 2012, um, object detectors have improved their accuracy quite a lot. And in the next two lectures, we will cover two types of deep learning based object detectors, the one stage detectors and the two stage detectors. Now, the one stage detectors follow still the paradigm of feature extraction plus classification and localization, which means localizing the objects with a bounding box and at the same time assigning a class to that bounding box. And they do this in one stage. So feature extraction, classification and localization in one go. Two stage detectors, on the other hand, separate this process to actually deliver more accurate results. And what they do is they do feature extraction then they extract the object proposal, so these regions of interest that we have been discussing in this lecture, and only on those they perform classification and localization. So famous uh, one-state detectors, you might have heard these names, and these are the detectors that we will see in the one-stage detector lecture. They are uh, YOLO, SSD, RetinaNet, and then point-based detectors like CenterNet, CornerNet, or ExtremeNet. And the two-stage detectors, perhaps even more famous, are um, the RCNN family with FastRCNN and FastRCNN. And then we will also cover other types of detectors like SPPNet, RFCN, and FPN. So stay tuned for the next lectures on one-stage detectors and two-stage detectors.